Good afternoon, and welcome to the Art Institute, everybody. It's wonderful to have you here in person this afternoon. Um, a quick reminder to turn off or silence your cell phones with my thanks. Um, my name is Joe. I'm with the Engagement Programs team, and we're so happy to have you here joining us to celebrate the installation Our Friend Fluid Metal by artist Nancy Rubens. Throughout her career, Nancy Rubens has created monumental sculptures amassed by found with found everyday objects, mobile trailers, canoes, airplane parts, and playground equipment. Two works from her series, Our Friend Fluid Metal, are presented in Chicago for the first time in an installation composed by the artist on the Bloom Family Terrace. Nancy is joined in conversation today by Anne Goldstein, who is Deputy Director and Dittmer Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the museum. With a curatorial career spanning over 35 years, Anne is known for her commitment to make the museum a home for art, artists, and a diverse range of audiences. She's recognized for her expertise in the fields of minimal and conceptual art of the 1960s and 70s, as well as contemporary practice. Anne's upcoming projects include The Vibrating Slab, an exhibition of the work of Berlin-based artist Josephine Pride, which opens in the Abbott Galleries in the Modern Wing October 1st, and Stanley Brown opens in April of 2023. Uh, there will be a brief Q&A at the close of the program, and we'll have microphones in the aisles. Kindly ask you to use them so everyone can hear you in this echoey but lovely room. Um, and with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Anne and Nancy to the stage. You all set? Yep. Great. Thanks, Joe. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, and thank you for your patience during a little wait. We had a little bit of technical stuff, and um, we wanted to make everything as perfect for you as possible today, so thank you. I also just want to start with a few thanks to besides to Joe from our engagement team, to Lizzie, Miguel, and Izzy. I also want to extend a very warm thanks to the Bloom Family Endowment Fund, which supports exhibitions of modern contemporary sculpture and made this exhibition possible, and a very special, warm, and grateful welcome to Barbara Bloom Call. I also want to express my gratitude to Nancy's extraordinary studio team, Yayoi Shino Nuari, who is the executive director, uh, Colin Cook, and they were incredible collaborators and supporters of this project. I'm also thrilled to welcome and offer our deepest thanks to Leda Grazan of Gagosian Gallery and Rona Hoffman of Rona Hoffman Gallery here in Chicago, who's had such a long history with Nancy. Welcome. I also, yeah, this can just be like really casual. <laughs> I also want to call out a couple members of the museum's team, including our incredible colleague, Michaela May, curatorial assistant in modern contemporary art, who's been an extraordinary par partner on this project, as well as Andrew Holler and former colleagues, Susie Oppenheimer and Courtney Smith. And of course, our deepest grat gratitude goes to this wonderful person sitting next to me, Nancy Rubens. And I just, <laughs> and I just want to amplify and add a little bit to Joe's lovely introduction. Working since the early 1970s, Nancy is widely recognized for her large-scale sculptures and drawings that boldly challenge, if not explode, these conventional categories. Living and working in Topanga Canyon, California for nearly 40 years, Nancy was first recognized for monumental sculptures created by embedding small household appliances, hair dryers, toasters, vacuums, and irons in concrete and building up towering and billowing structures. Since the 1980s, she has created extraordinary works assembling groupings of amassed found everyday objects, as Joe said, discarded mobile trailers, canoes, airplane parts, mattresses, water heaters, and playground equipment that are suspended in seemingly gra gravity-defying compositions. They employ the engineering principle of tensecrity, or balancing compression with tension. She tethers massive parts together using thin steel trusses and tension cables, allowing the discrete components to remain visible. 
This process enables her assemblages to reach colossal scales and take on almost supernatural forms, harnessing immense force and energy. And although she is most known for her sculptures, drawing has also been, and always been, an integral and voluminous part of her work since the early 1970s. So before we look at some works, and we're just gonna have this slide, these slides continue to scroll for a bit, I just wanted to stop talking for a minute and turn to you, Nancy, and ask you a bit if you could talk about your background and influence as we know, I know that you, you studied at the Maryland Institute of the Arts and UC Davis, you lived in San Francisco and New York before settling in LA. Thank you again. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you for gen your generous introductions. And it's a real treat to be here, you guys. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> no. We're not quite used to the handheld, yeah. but we're going to get there. So just tell us to hold it up if you can't hear okay. us. Thank you. Uh, I first, uh, I, I went to art school in Baltimore at the Maryland Institute College of Art. At, called, they call it MICA now. And um, I studied, m my most important mentor there was an artist named Sal Scarpita. And Sal was of the World War II generation. He showed with Leo Castelli. He was of a generation or young, a little older than the pop artist that Leo was so well known for representing. And Sal had one foot in Italy and one foot in the US and he, he had a, a great understanding of the art de pavora, art de pavora artist, uh, the poor art artist uh, that were coming from Italy at that point in time. And I had a real innate understanding of what he was doing. So at my art school, uh, we would get these wonderful speakers coming in, artists, to talk to us about what they did from all over the country, all over the world. And there were a group of artists that came in from Northern California that I was really enamored by. Uh, Roy DeForest, um, uh, Wayne Tebow, Clayton Bailey, uh, Bob Hudson and Richard Shaw, um, Bob Arneson, I was, I was, I really was uh, enamored by the, this Northern California funk stuff. It was raw, it was vulgar, it was funny, and it was incredibly inventive. And so I was lucky that I got to go to the school to, at UC Davis and I studied with Arneson. Excuse me. <clears throat> And that was uh, a, a really important time for me. I, after I graduated from Davis, I went to San Francisco and had a waitress job. I was waitressing 48 hours a week, and I was teaching in the Art Institute day school at night, so I was working a lot. And uh, I would go with my friends to the Goodwills, and they'd like to get uh, vin vintage clothing. It was just old, dirty clothes. And I, I wasn't really interested in that, but I, I would see these television sets for 25 cents each. And I was stunned by it. Like, 25 cents, you can get a great big television set. I grew up, I was born in 52, so televisions are different than what they are now. They were big and they were wooden and plastic and knobs and color and speakers, and they were big. I thought, oh, 25 cents, that's great. So I, I collected close to 300 of them. And I had an idea that I was gonna build this piece on my roof, which my landlord wouldn't let me do. <laughs> and I built something else, and I was never satisfied with it. I painted it fluorescent orange, I pa packed it in concrete, I turned them upside down. It, it really wasn't a successful work in my mind. So, I started de developing these very thin concrete walls. I, I started taking, because I clay was really the sculpture that I had worked with before. Clay, I never fired the clay, but clay was how I expressed my sculptural uh, 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 conversation prior to that when I was a student. So this, the cement was like an air drying clay to me, air, air firing clay. 
So I started making these incredibly thin concrete walls that I could push and they would waver back and forth. And I was really impressed by the flexibility of that material, that it was hard concrete, but yet it had this innate flexibility in, in it that seemed contradictory to me that I really loved. I, I loved embracing this contradiction of the hardness of it, but it was yet very flexible. So I got a teaching job in Richmond, Virginia for a semester, like a villain for somebody who was taking sabbatical. And um, I thought, I need to start re rethinking these objects. And all throughout Richmond are bricks, beautiful brickwork. And sometimes in the brickwork, you'd see a great glob, a great glob of bricks all lumped together, kind of melted and smeary. And, I'd say, what is that? Everything is so meticulous and fastidious about these straight bricks and that great lump up there in the wall. Oh, that's from the Civil War. That's from when Richmond, you know, that's when the Richmond, the, you know, Civil War, that's the residue of it. And I thought, whoa, that's, that's something. I, I need to think about that. So I started going back to the Goodwills and Salvation Armies and seeing... They had massive, massive, massive quantities of these small, geeky little electric appliances, and they were free. And I thought, this is fantastic, because for me, using these objects to make the work was really a matter of economy. You know, Windsor Newton paint, that's nice, but you pay a boatload for a little tube, or if you want to make something in bronze or even steel, you're paying a lot for this stuff. And here I was getting these fabulous elements with little colored buttons, pink, blue, and yellow, shiny stainless steel or shiny chrome or avocado green or orange, or all these different shapes and sizes and colors and materials that I could never make if I tried, and it was free. So I just started collecting filling my station wagon with this stuff and hoarding it and bringing it to the studio that the university gave me. And I could build these very long, very thin concrete walls. They could be 14 feet high and as, far, as long as 45 feet long. And I would stack the appliances in such a way that it was like rock work. They interlocked. You know, one shape goes this way, one shape goes that way, or another, a little hair dryer is round. So you could fit all these things in and they would interlock. And I could push these huge things, there were tons of concrete in them, push them ever so gently and they would waver. And I thought, wow, man, I really hit something here. This is good. You know? So I get back to my studio in San Francisco and I start playing around with rebar, which is something I used in these thin concrete walls. And I realized I could make these exotic shapes. I could cantilever them. I could make these voluptuous, voluminous, exotic shapes. So that was really how I started using those appliances. That's amazing. And and also, it's so great to hear how you just started to source things, and because yeah. I think it's such a interesting part of all of these sculptures. I, I actually think that we can go to the new deck, and because okay. I think the first the first image actually relates okay. to what you were just There's talking big about. There's billboard, which is a work that was first that was yep. made here in Illinois. So. Yeah, not far from here in Berwyn, Illinois. Um, I had had that was 1980. That fall, I had ha uh, that winter in February, I had had my first show in New York, and um, a collector who had a, a, a lot of shopping centers all over the place was collecting art and uh, wanted to put it in the shopping centers, and he saw this piece of mine, and mm, he had to have it. So I built this piece, big billboard, uh, for his shopping center. And we, the only pre prerequisite he gave me was to build it so a car could bounce off it. <laughs> so I, could, I built this 10, 10 foot tall kind of axle shaped plinth. Um, and, you know, sure enough, a car could bounce off that. And um, it, it's this kind of minimal, enigmatic shape that. Um, I, I really loved that piece. At that time, I was thinking a lot about people like Grandma Prisby, 
Simon Rodia, uh, Grandma Prisby built bottle, build, bottle buildings in uh, Simi Valley in California. And there were lots and lots of people uh, during the Depression in, in America and in Europe who were building uh, artworks and sculptures and buildings out of empty bottles. Uh, actually, in Europe, not long after World War I, People were building lots of things with these glass bottles and cement. And one beer manufacturer thought it would be a good idea, you know, a round bottle is harder to build with, that he would build his, uh, design his beer uh, bottles to be like a brick. But the trouble was that nobody wanted to buy them as beer because it reminded when you go and drink your beer, you don't want to think about work. <laughs> and, it, and it disturbed people to think about the brick and the work while they were drinking the beer. So it, it didn't really go over even though people used them in this way. So uh, I, I love the minimal quality of this and this weird candelaver shape. I, I was really happy with that piece. And what happened with it? Because I think it, uh, it was there about ten years, and people it made people crazy, <laughs> and the, and and also the the collector didn't maintain it properly, mm -hmm. and eventually he it it was knocked down. Are there any works extant like this? Are there any work that still exists from kind of, this from series? This? Nope. Yeah. No, none do. Okay. Yeah, I remember too. You talked about just the. In an interview, too, with, I mean, just this idea of like, I know this is not about this work specifically, but about the walls that you were making, the cement, and yes. that also you would, living in California, you experienced your first yes, earthquake. That, and, that's where that and came saw from. cement. Yes. I was bending. living in my yeah. studio at that time. I had grown up in the East Coast, and my studio, I was first living in San Francisco, and I was up late. With one night with some friends, we were drinking a beer, and all of a sudden the lamp in the middle of the build starts swinging, and it's a big cast concrete industrial building. And I look up and the wall goes whoop like that, and I went, whoa. That big, hard, solid concrete building under the right circumstance behaves like water. And that's when I really started thinking about the contradictions in mm -hmm. these materials. Mm -hmm. Also, I had a sleeping loft. I had built a loft to sleep in in my studio. And above, uh, I was my head wasn't that far from the ceiling. And whoever the guys were that were making it must have had made the cast the concrete, had a, had a pork chop sandwich that day. <laughs> because embedded right above where my head was, was a, it was, a, it was the silhouette, you know, embedded, the pork chop bone had fallen out. But it was a negative <laughs> space of a pork chop bone. And also an actual stub of a cigar. So the guy must have had a cigar, thrown it in there, threw his pork chop bone in there. The, when the mold came off, the pork chop bone fell out, and the stub of the cigar was still in there. <laughs> and I would stare at that every night as I was going to sleep. And it really made me think, I think, about the things that came later yeah. for me. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking about things that came later, we jump ahead about 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go into some into the work, um, which is the body of work that's up on the Bloom Family Terrace. Um, and there's Paquito and Paquito's Cluster. And um, we have a few slides um, yes. that include um, work from the terrace, from when this body of work was first yes. shown in New York yes. at Gagosian, and also some works, yes. studio shots. So I'm going to scroll through so, some okay. while you Talk about these are the ones with the playground yes, animals. Yes. Yeah. Now, in in uh, where I live in L.A., there's a fella uh, who finds metal objects. He just has a sense for metal objects, and he collects them and hoards them, and he buys them and he sells them, and that's how he makes his living: collecting, hoarding, buying, selling. Right? And we've become friends, and every once in a while, he'll start bringing things over to me that he thinks that I would like and that I will, you know, take, buy from him, purchase from him. So he started bringing over to me a number of years ago, uh, probably in, uh, 
I don't know when, you know, a number of years ago, probably 2010, around there. Uh, some of these little, uh, very strange looking to me, cartoony, figurative uh, objects that were used on playground. Uh, out, they were outside of grocery stores and on playgrounds. They're little animals on springs. And they were all being ripped out of uh, the public, you know, the playgrounds and the shopping centers or wherever they went uh, because now they were deemed dangerous and they weren't in, in vogue. They weren't the kind of toys that children play with now. So I was kind of catching them at the cusp of between when they were useful, when they were pulled out, and when they were ready to go to the smelter to be melted down to be made into something else, right? They were just in that spot where they were in the in-between. And he brings me some of these and I go, God, they are so strange looking and they're figurative. And I've stayed as far away from the figure as I possibly could throughout my work. Uh, now, I, I have to say this also, I think everything is figurative. So all the elements I use tend to be figurative. A, a, a canoe is figurative, a rowboat is figurative, a, a, you know, a mobile home is figurative because we make them and we're what we are. So this chair, you know, wouldn't be shaped this way if it wasn't for what I got going on here. So we, it, it, everything, it, it, it's about us. So I thought, well, you know, be brave, take these things on. So I, I amassed a large quantity of them, and then at a certain point, me and my crew started working with them. Um, and I realized, I learned if I amassed enough of them together, I could find that point of abstraction that I so yearned for, that I was so looking for in these things. So I started making the Chunkus Majoris, I think, was the first one. Which one and, is that? Is uh, it that's, in... that? I don't think that's in the slide. Okay. It might be in one of the ones inside the gallery. Yeah, let me, I can go back. Uh, uh, I don't see it yet. Mm -mm. I think it, it mm -hmm. I have a picture. I think it's one of those in the distance you okay. saw in the gallery, but it's hard to tell because yeah. it's from... Um, and when I started working with it, I thought, whoa, this thing, you know, I started thinking about things flying around in outer space and the material. And I was still kind of scratching my head about these objects. And then one day it dawned on me. These things, they started making them in the late 40s, early 50s, right after World War II, right? Now, there was a fellow, Mr. Huffman, a gentleman that I used to buy my airplane parts from. And Mr. Huffman would proudly show me pictures of himself in the National Geographic magazine with a mobile smelting, smelting unit that he would take throughout the Southwest and melt down the fleet after the airplane fleet after World War II. And, I, and, uh, and Mr. Huffman, Huffman's property had mountains, literally, of airplane parts. And one day, I, and I, I started buying them from him at that point in time. It, scrap metal was, uh, the aluminum was 10 cents a pound, so I'd pay him 10 cents a pound to buy this stuff. And it was really beautiful aluminum. It's, uh, it's aeronautic aluminum, which is stronger than normal aluminum. And sometimes we get titanium, sometimes we get stainless steel, really beautiful materials. And I realized, ah, that's what these are. These are the airplanes that Mr. Huffman melted down because all of the soldiers came back from the war, the baby boom clicked in, and in the late 40s and the early 50s, the walls of the aluminum on these objects was quite thick. And as the price of aluminum went up over time, the walls got thinner and thinner and thinner till we got a, a McDonald's Mr. Fish sandwich. Whatever he's called, I think I'm Mr. Fish. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. I think maybe is it McFish, McFish, something. <laughs> yeah, there was a McFish in there, and I thought, okay, this was kind of near the end of the the, the of the aluminum when the walls were getting thinner, and that really m made me start thinking about these things. And I thought, well, okay, before 
They were this, they were the airplanes or some tin can, you know, aluminum Coke cans or something like that. And before that, you know, maybe it was in the earth because aluminum is much cheaper to recycle than to mine because it melts at a very low temperature. So maybe it was in the earth some point before that, right? Of course, not just maybe, it was in the earth, it was mined. And then I realized, wow, before it was in the earth, it was dust particles in the universe. It was just stuff flying around. And then those dust particles, they conglomerated and coag you know, coagulated and made lumps of stuff. And then those lumps of stuff became planets. And the planets started bashing into each other. And stuff was flying around all over the place. So I really realized that, that this stuff was really had this history that went on forever and ever and ever to you know, 13.9 billion years ago when the Big Bang happened. I thought, mm, okay, this is <laughs> material. <laughs> and so I started thinking about these things as in terms of being these lumps of stuff flying around in outer space. So Chunkus Majoris to me felt like a great meteor. This one we're looking at now is Spiral Ragusa. I started naming them these kind of goofy names. That, I was curious about your titles. because they're Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, they're kind of wonky names of things. Uh, when I, so, At some point, not that long ago, you know, in the last 20 years, my dad, when he was very old, uh, was giving money to an uh, astronomer's society. And in order, and one of the gifts they gave to them was they, he got them to name some star or some planet or some asteroid or some lump of something flying around <laughs> in outer space after me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he sent me a map, a star map of where it is in the universe. <laughs> and, and it really, I thought, well, if they can name something after me, I can make up any name for these, <laughs> you know, that I want. So I started thinking thinking of kind of wonky astro astronomical names, you know, like, you know, a spiral nebula, yeah. spiral ragusa. It sounded like an Italian food or <laughs> a piece of pasta. Or <laughs> Fantastic. So I'll just scroll back. This is such an extraordinary one. Yeah, this isn't the greatest Im uh, uh, sl slide of this uh, picture of this. I. I, I uh, we're There's taking another one pictures. from kind of... That's a better image yeah. of that piece. Yeah. Just how it cantilevers mm -hmm. out. It's, it's just a 65 so foot improbable. cantilever. Yeah. And I have a fabulous, fabulous engineer. She's figured out how to design for things for me that will take earthquakes, hurricanes, and, you know, the end of the world. However, she's also made them so that they're uh, quite uh, flexible. She knows how I work. Mm -hmm. I don't pre-plan anything except I want it to go into space in this direction and I want it to cantilever that way. So she's figured out how to design them for me so that we have these things, these extensions that we can clamp mm -hmm. on to the main structure. And this structure within uh, the work, uh, it has a whole uh, tension uh, system that is like what bridges, uh, uh, what holds mm -hmm. up bridges. Mm -hmm. So cables were sent through the stainless steel structures and then it was tightened and, and so that it's all held together by a similar system that we hold the objects onto the uh, structures with, that we, we tie. And this, the objects themselves have a structural integrity so that you can build these great cantilevers with the structural integrity mm -hmm. of the actual objects. Oh. Which so. wasn't so with those yeah. ginky little and appliances. And these are really heavy, too. Oh, yeah. They, they have a kind of lightness because of their incredible dynamic no, energy, are, but they're yeah. really heavy. Yeah. And, and the ones that are on the terrace, um, because we have late weight capacity, they were the only ones that they yes. were kind of the smaller ones. Yes, because they the, were the petite. They were the ones that worked with the weight capacity yes. of the terrace. And this one you made a little bit later. Yes, uh, Piquito. Uh, pi uh, is Piquito's this Piquito's cluster. cluster? Yeah. Yes, this came, and this has very little uh, steel structure in it, just enough to tie onto the base. And it's all just the little things themselves connecting. 
So speaking of um, tornadoes and so on, I mean, the, there's a couple of works from this series that mm -hmm. are here in Chicago right mm -hmm. now from the Correct. Diverse Folia. Um, and maybe I'll scroll through to get to those um, because they're, a bit, they're gonna be up, I think, for about a year. Mm -hmm. So people can go see mm -hmm. them. Um, I'm just, this is the first one. Yes. And, um, this is Agrifolia majoris. And um, these are made out of these very strange um, cast animal figures that uh, the same fella has been able to find for me. Um, we had on my property, uh, just out of collecting from him, uh, these great cast iron turtles and wolves. I think they're in one of the other, mm -hmm. uh, the other piece that is on the lake. Um, and I started playing around with those and those cast iron is extraordinarily heavy. You know, airplane parts, they're light, you know. Ann and I mm -hmm. could pick up something as long as this, uh, 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 Stage, stage and we could just pick it up and move it around. It would be nothing. Um, and and these and these this cast iron is very very heavy and it's brittle. It's an unforgiving material. But we were able to find a way to drill into it and use it structurally uh, to build these uh, large pieces and uh, these different. Uh, uh, bronze hippopotamuses and these wolves that were all different poses that were life-size wolves and I and all these turtles and I thought uh oh, this these are weird and that one was called dense bud and so then when uh the fellow who finds these things for me came and saw what I did with dense bud he said you want some hogs I think I have a picture of dense bud which is this oh, yeah, dense, that's bud? dense bud okay, okay. so this is the first yeah. one was, is up on, um, the first one is down at, um, the, whoops. Is there a detailed this, of Yeah, there's a detailed bud. dense. This, so this one is just for people to know, this is at Promontory Point, about 54th and, and the lakefront. Um, and then Dense Bud is um, at 5300 North um, Lakeshore Drive in Edgewater. And there's a detail here. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see the wolves. They're in all these different crouching, moving positions. Um, and he offered me these hogs, and I said, yeah, bring them by. And he, sure enough, he brought me these huge aluminum life-size hogs. They were brand new, freshly cast. And I thought, what in the world do people do with these things? And I thought, well, maybe a, a barbecue sign, you know, maybe a... <laughs> I don't know, you know, maybe a hot, you know, we sell pork. I, I wasn't really sure, but then when he saw I liked those, he brought me what was equivalent to a Sears and Roebuck catalog. I don't, you guys are too young to know what that is. <laughs> a catalog. Of, <laughs> <laughs> of a huge variety of all these aluminum creatures you could order and have made for you. Crocodiles, crocodiles with their tails up, crocodiles with their tails down, crocodiles with their mouths open, crocodiles. <laughs> you know, the deer, the gentle deer with eating grass, the deer that's, whose head is up, the, a, a, a moose, uh, buffaloes, uh, big longhorn steers, anything I wanted. And uh, now, the first hogs that Jeff brought me were tack welded and then they had Bondo in them. I said, you know, this tack welding business isn't gonna do for me, Can't, because they, they were making them to order. So I paid a small amount extra, and the guy made a contiguous weld. So what I ended up with was these fabulous tubes. You know, animals are tube-shaped, and a tube is one of the stronger elements that you can get. So structurally, this was just beautiful to me. So that's when we started uh, you can go back to the the other image. And is this the first time you um, kind of used materials that weren't already 
disposed of? Yeah, these were, uh, some of them, the bronze pieces were, have been around. Mm -hmm. All those aluminum pieces were freshly minted off the press, you know? And those were made out of the melted down, yeah. tor you know, equipment, yeah. the can on the street, you know, they were, so they were fresh in the, in the making of the, you know, in the cusp of all, in the, and, and when you trajectory of all this, when you first encountered this, these kind of crazy life-size ornamental animals, mm -hmm. um, and acquired them, did you do you, do you live with it for a while? Do you yeah. and think about? I mean, yeah. or is it? I mean, yeah, yes, yes. I know that you accumulate things on your property, and, and yeah, and then I scratch my head and think about it, and then I. In a flash, one day, I figure out what I need to do. It, it, you know, there's a long time of, uh, and then, ah, that's what I do. And so, um, again, uh, this piece, I worked with my engineer, and she figured out a way to uh, send, I think it's a six-inch or an eight-inch stainless tube. We, we strung, like you string a bead, a, a couple of these larger animals. I don't know if it was a tiger or a moose or a tiger <laughs> and a moose. It's like zebras that. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then the other tube-shaped uh, pieces, you know, all of them mm -hmm. are tubes, but we could uh, uh, use our stainless steel mm -hmm. cable and the tensegrity, mm -hmm. as you said, the, uh, it's mm -hmm. compression and tension, and uh, build out these marvelous cantilevers, so this thing was kind of spiraling and flying all around. Um, and I really loved making this thing. It looks spectacular. And, uh, one thing I want to say, too, is in, in making these, I love turning those objects upside down because when you turn them upside down, they no longer look like that thing that's supposed to be on the lawn. You see the workmanship in it. You see how the casting was made. You see the little holes in the feet where the, the metal, you know, was poured through or, you know, didn't get poured into. And you see the welds and sometimes like on the, on the, uh, 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 alligators and crocodiles, you see a big hole on the bottom of them, uh, which was because they were low on the ground and I think they were trying to conserve aluminum. So you can see into them and you can see all the welds and the workmanship. So you see a weld and you see where the weld was having trouble and somebody sticks it, one of the welders stuck a, a shim in there. And you, so you see not just this geeky cartoony animal, but you see an earnest workman's time in making it. So it had this funny, there was something very real about them, but there was also something mm -hmm. kind of silly and made up and cartoonish about them too. I'm just gonna move ahead because um, as you've continued to work with mm -hmm. these animals mm -hmm. um, in the Fluid Space series, but with this series, you and kind of talking about them being tubes and that you can mm -hmm. see that you've actually, you started to slice them. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so they're... So when I build these very large pieces, I need to send out a small army of my crew and often my, I, me too, uh, to install these things. And as I was trying to figure out a way to make a piece that was satisfying to me, because. I'm the person I have to please most. Um, and that would have the complexity and richness and scale, not, not physical scale, but complexity and scale so that as you walked around it, you couldn't see it all at once. You don't see them all at once. It changes completely as you keep walking around this thing. So, I started, I went back to an old friend of mine, which is a table. I've done a lot of things, table and airplane parts. It was a way that I used to, you know, the table as a stand-in for a piece of architecture or, or graph paper, you know, it's, it's a grid. So I started using these uh, stainless steel tables uh, and started cutting these objects up and uh, developing these pieces. And our only prerequisite was really to get it into a shipping container or a truck in one piece. So we always kept the measurements, you know, 
pinned in front of us and always measuring and having the system so that we could get in, in, in and out of something like that. And what I loved especially about these is that you can see the cartoonish outside. This is a beautiful one to see that with. And you also see uh, the inside of the object where the pores happened you know, how the bronze was poured, and you see these kind of uh, uh, striations and organic uh, dripping of, of the bronze throughout as it's going down the mold. And you see how the guys welded it and the shims that go in there. And I, I, I really love that with these works. And this, and we're just about toward the end, and then we can open it up to a few questions, but these are yes. some shots from the studio, and then um, and then we go to um, the recent exhibition uh, last year yeah. at Gagosian in last LA, mm -hmm. um, where you also showed some, some drawings. Yes. And I know this conversation today has focused more on sculpture, but drawing has been such an integral part of your yes. work from all the way back. And um, I think we have some, a couple yeah. of images of um, just you know these extraordinary works where you basically take graphite and and just rub it again and again and again to mm -hmm. saturate and kind of create mm -hmm. a graphite surface to to mm -hmm. the paint, paper mm -hmm. these kind of flowing metallic surfaces. I draw on the floor, mm -hmm. and it takes a long time to build up the drawing. Um, and I use a really good rag paper that <clears throat> can take the drawing that I put onto them, and I have thousands and thousands of pencils uh, that are all pre-sharpened, and I just go through them. Uh, and then uh, when I put it onto the wall, it happens very quickly, like mm -hmm. in a matter of, <clears throat> you know, a couple minutes, and that's that. You know, it takes months and months and months to get the graphite onto the drawing, onto the paper. What I love about these drawings, and I started drawing in this way, kind of, when I was in, it's evolved and changed when I was in graduate school, and I was trying to figure out what is a drawing? Is a drawing, <coughs> excuse me, a thing? Is it, do you draw something? Do you draw this bottle? That's how I was trained to, I draw figures, I draw bottles, I draw landscapes. But maybe a drawing could be just that, just a thing in itself, you know? So I started playing around with that when I was in graduate school. I would make these drawings, and they were, then I would make academic drawings of the drawings. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I would make a, 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 a drawing like you would of a bottle mm -hmm. of my drawings, because I was trying to figure out what is a drawing, what are the boundaries of what a drawing is, what can it be, you know? So, um, I, I love making them. And then, of course, the sculptures also have a drawing element with yep. the trusses and the cables and mm -hmm. uh, that kind That's of right. linear. And also with the drawings, once those layers and layers and layers of pencil marks are built up and you see you know, when you walk on the beach and your footprint goes on the sand and the ocean comes up and washes it away, but you see this moment in time really briefly. So what I was trying to do is collect moments of time on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So you see all these moments in time built up. And what also happens is, like the sculptures, but in a very different way, you can't see them all at once mm -hmm. because of the way the lines go and where the light is. You have to literally walk around the room to see it from this direction or that direction to see, because it keeps changing mm -hmm. as the light, mm -hmm. as you move, the light changes and the angles of the marks and the layering of the marks. Also something that happens with the marks that I love is that it becomes this really weird, deep, liquid space that even though it's just a lousy, skinny piece of paper, it has a depth that seems to go on forever. 
And I, I, I just, that was really, uh, that really struck a point for me. And again, it was this weird embracing of these odd contradictions that to me were very beautiful. They're extraordinary and really extraordinary to hold up close because you do see, it isn't just like the idea of just the surface of the graphite as this kind of perfect, it, you see every single mark that went into it. And mm -hmm. so there's kind of directions to the marks and yes. on each of the, and in, even in multiple ways on each sheet of paper before it comes together. And some of these works have also been of colossal scale as well. This is one that we're very proud that came into the yes. collection last year. Yes, I'm happy to say that. Yes. Thank so you. We. Thank you. And um, so with that, um, I think we are about a few minutes. We have, uh, I think we have some time for some questions. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to help get to those questions. And there's Tony with the question immediately. <laughs> Tony Tassik. Yeah. Um, Hi, Tony. Hello. Uh, <laughs> there's a, there seems to be a, ten, I mean, I don't know, this is my response and you tell me what, how you feel about it, but there seems to be a tension between the imagery and then the form or, all, or any, and the physics of how you deal with the form. And today, you don't say a lot about, I'm just curious if that's kind of a strategy, like you don't say a lot about the actual images. It's almost as though, you know, what I, I find interesting is there's a kind of a tension between, for instance, if I have empathy for this animal, and then just realize, and then just seeing it as this form that's, as you say, you can't capture the whole thing at They're once. not animals. Right, <laughs> okay. They're, they're, they're chunks of aluminum or bronze that for some reason people put them in that they were molded that way. <laughs> That's a funny answer. <laughs> but they are animals too. <laughs> no, they are not. <laughs> okay. Well, they're images of animals. They're cartoon images of animals. They're, okay, they're, they're very stylized images of animals, but they are far from an animal. Of course, but, uh, but my point is that it seems that that's part of the work, yeah. is, to, is to get away, for, you know, to stop the viewer from seeing them as just animals, or from the- They are from not the, animals. Right, okay. <laughs> I know, okay. <laughs> they are to help the viewer to see beyond that. Right, okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, we actually have a. Oh, right here we go. Um, I was curious if you can talk more how uh, craft play, play a role in your work and more so your trajectory. And I ask because. The way you talk about the work, you use words like clumpy and chunky and goofy. But then you were really tight on what an animal is. And then you talked about how you gave a lot of attention um, in your talk to detail of the, the earnestness of the craft workers who pour the aluminum and how they connect. So you obviously have a, a love for it, but you talk about it in such a way that's kind of Goofy and cartoon. Yeah, it, it's funny you use the word craft. It's funny you use the word craft. When I was a young person and I took, I was, I worked in clay. At that time, clay was considered a craft, and it was a low, low art. It wasn't a high art, and um, uh, I refused to be fall into that niche at that time. So I just used the clay and I never fired it because the craftsmanship in clay is very complex. Is that a red iron oxide? And whose glaze is that? Is that, you know, so did it fire in the kiln? Did it crack? Is your salt glaze salty? You know, and I, I, I always had trouble with that. But oddly enough, as you say, as things evolved, as things developed, I kind of came out the other end. And the craftsmanship and the, the technical finesse in these things 
is quite exquisite, really. And that evolved, that developed over time. And it developed uh, over time with my crew and myself and different, and every time we would use a new material, we would find a new technique uh, that really helped us, you know? What kind of bit are we drilling with? Oh, we have a pine cone bit. That really makes a good hole these days, you know? And is the stainless steel wire we use, you have no idea how tricky it is to get a consistent batch of the stainless steel wire. We, we, we buy the wire, in, I buy the wire in, in um, spools in massive quantities, 50 pounds, 50 pound spools, and then we make it into cable, four strand cable. I used to always do it by hand. I would, as the guys were working, I would be making the cable with my fingers. And now we, some kid worked with us and said, well, that's stupid and slow. Look, you can get a little hook on your drill and put it, we call the hook lucky. It's one of those eye hooks that you screw into the wall to hang things on. We put that into a drill and put it on our wire and really put the drill on low and you can just slowly turn the cable until you get, you don't want it too tight, you don't want it too loose. You want it loose enough so that my crew can put it through uh, what used to be a screwdriver and now we use a, um, a tool uh, that you usually hit things with. Uh, it's a, a it's a forged piece of steel. I don't even know what it's called, but we sharpen it and we, it, it, we make it sharp so you can put it between the wire and we call it a twister. And so you can twist this thing and then, uh, and make it tight. So each piece of cable can be made to the, to like piano wire tension that we need it to be. And over time we develop fancier uh, safety gear. You know, we used to use tennis shoes and that was it, <laughs> and some gloves. Now we have shields and goggles and the right kind of hard hat, and we have OSHA training, and there's climbing gear, and we know how to use articulated booms and cranes and spider cranes. And, you know, over time, the craft evolved, and the craft developed through the need of what the sculpture was about. Those really early pieces out of the appliances, I didn't really have a yen to make anything big, especially. But when I saw all those appliances, the huge quantity, the overwhelming quantity there, I, I was just tapping a tiny, you know, tiny bit in this massive source. It demanded that those sculptures be huge, you know? It was the material that told me what needed, what the sculpture needed to be. So in turn, it's the work that is telling us how to develop this craft, as you call it. Is that, is that what you asked? Is that your question? <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think there was a lady. Oh, <clears throat> I, I think that the, the last question encapsulated very much um, some of my reaction. When in working and completing my PhD, um, which was in psychology, I had to take statistics, which was a language that I really did not use. And you also had this how do you define your terms? And when do you take your outcome measure? And as you speak, your definition, the man who asked the question, and he kept saying, well, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? He must, you must have repeated that a good three or four times. And we never got a direct answer. Um, and so I'm struck by how um, almost philosophical your approach is and how when you talk about fluidity, it's your thinking that's fluid. And that's what is reflected in all of your work 
as your definitions change, as your is this the outcome measure to collect all these television sets? No, that's not the outcome measure. You made the thin wall. Then you took the parts. And so you are constantly in fluidity, not of the material, but of the thinking. Oh, that's kind of you to say. Thank you. Um, also, in terms of what do you mean, I can't say what I mean. I don't know how to. I don't have that skill or gift or I'm not a poet. But I can show you what I mean. It, it, it's something that the, only the eyes can, can it, it's through the eyes that I can tell you what I mean. I, I don't know how to explain it. I couldn't if I tried. Thank you. Uh, seeing, has, seeing how as you don't really uh, plan anything, do you ever finish something and want to make a change to it? Um, and how exactly does that work if all the pieces are kind of relational to each other, counterweight? Hard to understand. Yeah. Alex, it's a little hard. To, uh, I'm sorry, everybody. It's, it's, the acoustics are strange in here, and it's actually harder for us, even with the amplification. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, seeing as how you don't really plan anything, do you ever finish a sculpture or think you finish a sculpture and want to change a part of it, and how does that no, work? No, I'll make another one. It, 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 I, if I make something, when I'm done, I go, yeah, that's it, that I'm done. And then if an idea evolves, it's, that's the next piece. Hello. First of all, thank you for that piece on the north side of Chicago. It's just two blocks from my house. <laughs> and I visit it nightly. And I thank you because we finally have contemporary art on the north side. My question to you is, as I love how you describe the human scale of everything, and that I can relate to that. But tell me this. When you combine your elements and you're finally finished... Do you ever feel surprised? Do you step back and say, ooh, that one looks like this, or I didn't expect that one to feel like that? I'm curious about the I'm motion. always surprised. OK. <laughs> and, if, and if I'm not, it's no, it's no good. Microphone. I'm always surprised. But if I'm not, it's no good. <laughs> it, because making it shows me something that I, that's why you make things, so you can see them. And it's always something that you've never seen before, so that's why you make them. And you have an idea in your mind, but you don't know really what it, it's just a, it, it just a seed. It's just a, a, you know, a seed. Um, so hearing you talk about like the practical side of a lot of things, like the joinery and the, excuse me? Oh, like the joinery and the tension and stuff, it makes me wonder how you assemble your crew. Like are they, artists or architects or engineers or how do you who do you look for in building that team um, there are people that are are lovely people uh, Colin has worked with me since 1992 he was a graduate student of mine at UCLA um, he's my chief installer and then you know people people have joined the team and have lasted over years and then you know, it's just been this gradual accumulation that we all were kind of like, we all were just connected with each other. My engineer, I've had several engineers I've worked with, but recently, recently, maybe 20 years ago, I started <laughs> working with an engineer that I really clicked with and had, a, you know, I, and I, I'll tell you why I started working with her. I um, had an engineer who designed the piece at MoCA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he also designed the piece for the Einsteins because mm -hmm. he was their engineer. And um, he's structural engineer, structural engineers, and he knew how to design the big steel and the, you know, blah, 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 and we would, and, and then uh, when the piece was at MoCA, we were, and uh, uh, someone needed to certify it. And all it was designed was the structure of it. 
the airplane parts, the wire, nobody had run the numbers on. And that was a problem. And I went to my engineer, I said, who had designed that structure, you know, bud, we need the numbers for the wire. I'm not an aeronautic engineer. That's aeronautic engineering. And I thought, <laughs> oh man, this is a problem. And then Jamie has run numbers on all the wires. We, we uh, stress test the elements, you know, whether it's the little spring things or the animals or whatever it is. They're put through a stress test, so there's numbers for those. Or if it's a boat, she knows all the numbers, you know, so that all those elements can be put into numbers so that if I go to the city fathers, they can go, oh, yeah, we sit, feel safe. It, we, we have the numbers for this. We know it can go through a tornado, which is what happened at the lakefront here, right as they were installing. You know, it worked. <laughs> Thank you. I know that I think we're probably, yeah, we have maybe this last question. And then um, also, we, I just wanted to say that if you have questions, we're also going to go up to the um, Bloom Family Terrace afterwards. So please feel free to join us there. Please. Um, nice to meet you, Nancy. Um, I'm a student. Where I'm is studying the person? My, yeah, she's, I'm here. Yeah, straight ahead. <laughs> I see you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm studying my graduate uh, uh, degree here in SAIC. And I'm uh, like, whatever motivates me is uh, the deadline of submitting things. So I want to know what's motivating you and keeping you going and doing and creating things like all the time. So sorry, again, we're having a little trouble with the sound. Can you could, you, um, could you repeat? What motivates you to create artwork without any deadlines? Oh, I, I, Thank you. I, I, I uh, you're asking me how I create artworks without deadlines? Yeah, what motivates you to create? My I think brain. is that what motivates you to create artwork without any deadlines? Just my brain. <laughs> it's just the way I'm wired. <laughs> thank you, guys. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Anne.